Today's Old Testament reading is from the first book of Samuel, describing God's miraculous call into the life of the young Samuel. The passage begins with these words. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Though God was no less present with his people, the author nonetheless describes a sort of radio silence of God's words from the voice and vision of his prophets, even in the presence of a priest such as Eli. In so doing, the author also provides a haunting description, I think, of our modern age as well. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And while we know that our Lord Jesus Christ is present with us by the Holy Spirit, it certainly feels as though the word of the Lord is rare at times, does it not? The issue, of course, is not that God is no longer speaking to his people, but that his people more than ever refuse to listen to him. And there is an acute blame among the priests who fail to stand up for the revealed truth of sacred scripture and millennia of church teaching, and instead bend the knee to modern sexual and moral innovations, Anglican, Catholic, Orthodox, and Evangelical. There are no exceptions. The trap so many fall into, whether or not we are called to ordain ministry, is that we set the unrealistic expectation in our minds that we too need to hear the audible voice of God, just like young Samuel did, that unless we hear God booming down from the heavens to us or whispering in our ear at night, that perhaps he really isn't speaking to us at all. But we must know that God's audible intervention into the life of Samuel was in fact a miracle. And miracles of that type are exceedingly rare. What's more, if someone comes up to you and says he has a word from the Lord, it would be very wise, at the least, to take what comes next with a grain of salt. Not to mention that even if God spoke to us audibly, we, would we even be attentive enough to know that it was him speaking? In today's passage, for example, for example Samuel mistakes the voice of the Lord three times for the voice of Eli before he realizes who is actually speaking. And he was a prophet. How many more mistakes then might we make when trying to discern God's call in our lives? So we know that God speaks to us in many ways. But how does he do that? Well, the first and foremost is through his son, Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, the light of the world. Notice where Samuel was in the wee hours of the morning when the Lord spoke to him. Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Samuel was lying next to the ark of the covenant, the dwelling place of God's glory, containing the tablets of God's law that had been handed down to Moses on Mount Sinai. Unlike Eli, Samuel chose to rest not in his own place elsewhere, but near the dwelling place of God. By the miracle of the Incarnation, Jesus Christ also dwelt among us. He dwelt within the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant she was. And through his death, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven, we now have access to him by faith. And by faith we are united to him, and in particular when we receive, by faith, his body and blood in the sacrament of Holy Communion. In the same way that Jesus called Philip and Nathaniel, he calls each of us to follow him in repentance and faith. Each week in the words of institution of the Holy Eucharist, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. We also hear God speaking to us in the words of sacred scripture. 
both in our own personal devotions and when the church authoritatively teaches and defends the truth therein. Just as we draw near to the Lord in receiving Holy Communion, even as Samuel drew near to the Ark of the Covenant, we also make ourselves attentive to God's voice through the study of his word written. And when we submit ourselves to the authority of the undivided church, when she upholds it. Likewise, it is the abdication of this responsibility by church leaders the world over, which has led to the rarity of God's word in our day. Not because it is absent, but because the church who is called to be the custodian of Holy Scripture has abjectly abandoned her duty and instead over the last century has ordained much which is contrary to God's word written, to quote from Article 20 of our 39 Articles of Religion in the Anglican tradition. And she does so to win the praise of her sworn secular enemies. In a passage which won't make preachers any friends, St. Paul admonishes the church in Corinth for this very same reason. Some Corinthians were arguing that sexual, sexuality is a morally indifferent area, and Paul uses shocking Im- imagery here to demonstrate that this is absolutely not the case. Interestingly, the word St. Paul uses for immorality in this passage is translated directly as porneia, from which we derive the word pornography. And Paul is not speaking then about a general sense of evil or wrongdoing. He is speaking against sexual sin. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, Paul quotes his detractors, who may be twisting a slogan from his earlier preaching. And God will destroy both one and the other, Paul responds. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. The Corinthians considered sexual satisfaction a matter as indifferent as food and They attributed no lasting significance to bodily functions. What does it matter after all? It's just just your body. It's just biology. It's just a feeling. I would say there is a strong similarity there between the Corinthians and popular opinion today, except for the fact that we live in an age where the Corinthian mindset is taken to the extreme. Our culture doesn't view sexual pleasure as merely indifferent. It holds sexual freedom as the greatest of all moral goods, as a moral imperative. And the murder of innocent life by abortion is a central sacrament. As Catholic philosopher Dr. Peter Kraft, a professor at Boston College, points out, consider the slogan offered so many by the vocal supporters of abortion. This is my body. It's my choice. These are the exact same words offered to us by Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. This is my body given for you. One of those two people is lying, he asserts. Do we wonder what God is speaking to us? His son says in Matthew's gospel, As you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Will we have the courage to stand up for the life in the womb? to give voice to the voiceless. The world accuses Christians, accuses the church of being obsessed with sex in this manner for defending these issues, but we understand, on the contrary, that there are far, far greater eternal joys to ponder. And to elevate limitless sexual satisfaction is to obscure these greater beautiful realities which God has promised us. It is to obscure and to ignore the glorious call of God in Christ Jesus. It is not we who are obsessed with sex. On the contrary, it is everyone else. Now, when the Anglican Church caved on immorality at the Lambeth Conference in uh, 1930, the immorality of contraception, as it were, the floodgates of Pornea, which St. Paul denounces here, were opened. And having flooded every valley, now knock and crash at the gates of Rome. Every levy is broken, 
And along the way, it is a result of the church no longer listening to the voice of God, but the voice of men. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. So how are God's people to respond to mounting opposition, to difficulty, to hearing God's voice? How are we to fight against the temptation to despair? By dedicating ourselves to prayer. Samuel waited patiently and prayed three times, Here I am, for you called me. And at the last he said, Speak, Lord, for your servant listens. Just as Samuel waited patiently before the Lord, ready to listen, we must do the same. Whether we listen in faith to Christ's call to repentance, or in receiving the Holy Eucharist, or in reading God's written word, or in constant prayer. We must, above all, be ready to listen in patience. For God is speaking clearly to each and every one of us, every single day. But we will only hear him if we allow ourselves to be silent, rather than speak, and not just once, but with perseverance, each and every day. This is God's call our vocation, to thirst for him and to seek him and bless him every day as long as we live, just as the psalmist does, using the unique gifts that God has given each and every one of us. When we dedicate ourselves to him in this way, the word of the Lord will no longer seem rare, but we will receive it in its abundance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.